Amen. Amen. I was the associate slash youth pastor at a church plant in Fort Lee, New Jersey. The year was 1996, the last century. I had been there three years and I started to think that it was time for a change. And an opportunity came to me through a friend. I could potentially become the junior high pastor at a massive and rapidly growing mega church in the Midwest. This role had a lot of advantages that were highly appealing. At the time I was tent making or I was bivocational. Uh, and, and I was doing that for the sake of the church plant, but this job would have been well paid. It would offer benefits. It would offer the ability to buy a home. That church was well known and was prestigious in the world that I was a part of at the time. Plus, I would work with and, and learn from a few pastors that I highly esteemed. There were major advantages, but there was just one obvious disadvantage. Junior high kids. <laughs> it sounds like one of the circles of hell from Dante's Inferno to be the junior high pastor. And uh, my wife cut right through my confusion and angst. She simply said, how are you going to do that? You don't even like kids. <laughs> now, obviously, that's not entirely true. But I did abandon the idea and we went on to church planting and to poverty. It was the best help I could have received at the time to know that my wife cared most about the glory of God and, and my good. It was care for me and most importantly, her counsel was concerned with the glory of Christ. That is a massive help. And many times I can remember it was the voice of godly caring women that pointed me to maturity and to Jesus. My mother has done that many times, as you can imagine. My wife has done that many times. Even my daughters from time to time say something worth listening to. <laughs> and many other women have as well. I remember a time at my uh, growing, it, when I was a young man, my, the senior pastor at my home, his, his, the senior pastor's wife at my home church noted that, that she could see on my countenance that I was discouraged. And she just took it on herself to pull me aside and encourage me. It was, a, it was a moment in my life. I believe this is an experience we all have. If we stop to think about it, we begin to realize how shaping and powerful a woman's voice is. And this is part of the gift of women. Think about it, right from birth, the voice that we hear the most, or should, should hear the most, is the loving voice of our mothers enveloping us in, in, in their love for their newborn child. Before we even know that we're alive, before we're even conscious of life, we're immersed in the arms and the voice of our mothers the human who loves us the most and has already sacrificed the most just to see us come into the world. Now, of course, because of the brokenness of the world and sin, not all mothers are loving. We acknowledge that. We recognize it. God help us. And if this hasn't been your experience to have a, a loving mother, mother from birth, then remember that David said this, David, who knew something about being abandoned, David said this in Psalm 27, that his father and mother have forsaken him, but the Lord will take him in. The Lord takes in all who run to him. Nevertheless, it is amazing that even with the fallenness of humanity, generally speaking, mothers still envelop their children and their love. Isn't that amazing? Unbelieving mothers, mothers that don't know Christ at all. Generally speaking, because of the grace of God to this world, mothers still envelop their children in their love. And their words are a big part of that enveloping. Speaking love, speaking loving, helpful words is what it means to fulfill motherhood. 
It's also a part of what it means to fulfill womanhood. So let me put it like this for today, on this Mother's Day. Recognize the power of a woman's voice and deploy it, use it to magnify Jesus. The voice of a woman has a particular power, a strength of influence, often overlooked, oftentimes not recognized even by the women who carry it. And that voice should be used, but it should be used to the glory of Christ. So let's spend some time considering some biblical examples of this principle, and then we'll seek to stir up some faith for the use of the woman's voice. So first of all, the power of her voice, the power of her voice. We're going to look at some negative examples here, and I don't mean to be a downer on Mother's Day, uh, but don't take it that way. It's the biblical record. It's God's word. We're going to see that some things were done wrong. We're going to see sin. Uh, And that's going to help keep us uh, grounded in reality, and that's important and instructive, especially today, uh, to recognize that both men and women are sinners that need grace. Um, And I think this can be especially instructive today, and I think it's worth noting these cultural moments as we go past them. You know, for most of my life, I saw the rise, you saw, we saw the rise of feminism, right? Right? We saw the rise of feminism. There was a, it was a period there where it seemed like maybe feminism had triumphed or there was this, this strong cultural emphasis on feministic values and principles. But have you noticed, I think this is really important, have you noticed that the, the cultural moment seems to have passed by feminism? That feminism is no longer the en vogue cultural value that the cultural narratives have shifted their emphasis, now the culture cannot even admit to itself that it knows what a woman is. And I say it like that on purpose, because we know what a woman is. We know what a woman is here at Crossway Church, but everybody really knows what a woman is. But, But for some reason, the culture at large can't even bring itself to just outright admit, yes, I could tell you what a woman is. I can define what a woman is, even to the point where a a, a member, a judge on the Supreme Court of the United States of America refused to define what a woman is. Her answer being, I'm not a biologist. And these changing winds of societal values, they teach us something very important. So so now that we can't define a woman, we can, but the world is having trouble doing that, well, what happens to feminism? What happens to people that sacrificed and gave themselves to that? What happens to the Christians who let the world's values affect and infect their thinking about manhood and womanhood? Affect their marriages, affect their families, affect their, their engagement with the world? What happens to them? And so this should remind us that the changing winds of societal values teach us that we do best to continually hold to the word of God no matter what society is saying. No matter what becomes popular or unpopular or comes and goes, we stand on the word of God and in Jesus Christ. We stand with courage in this world. We stand as a a point of sanity and reality and truth, affirming and acknowledging that God is real, that he sent his son because he loves, and that all who call on the name of Jesus will be saved. You see, if you go along with the world's fantasies that are blown here and there by whatever is, is, is popular with the elites at the time, if you do that, you're going to find yourself in a dangerous place. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to your, it costs your soul too much to do that. And so, yeah, we're going to see some women sinning, and that's reality, but there's all, it's also going to teach us how the woman's voice ought to be used when we look at these examples, which also shows us how powerful the woman's voice in this world truly is. And it can be used for evil but it can also be used to the glory of Christ. 
in a way that no other voice can. And that should stir up faith in the women of God. That should stir up faith in the women that follow Christ to speak for his glory. So let's go to the first marital conversation ever recorded, although the actual words aren't recorded, but it's uh, described to us so we know that a conversation happens. And that's in Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve are going about their business, tending to the Garden of Eden, the Garden in Eden. And the serpent comes along. We know that this is the devil in serpent form. And he has come to insert rebellion against God. And so he comes and he, he shrewdly, craftily, deceptively, manipulated, manipulatively questions Eve. Doesn't go to the man but goes to the woman and attacks her with questions that will cause her to question reality as it is. To question what she knows. And he says to her, did God say that you can't eat of any of the fruit? And she says, oh, no, of course we can eat of the fruit. We just can't eat of this one tree. Because if we do, we'll die. And he says, well, you're not, you're not going to die if you eat that. God doesn't want you to eat that because he knows when you eat of it, you'll become like him. You'll be like powerful and knowledgeable like him. God's trying to keep something good from you, the devil's saying. And so that brings us to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So the enemy persuades Eve with words, and then Eve takes her words and then persuades her husband. And you can see in that persuasion the power inherent in the woman's voice. Never shortchange the devil's intelligence. The devil has been observing the human race since humans were created. And it probably is, it's, there's, there's probably, if we think it through, it's probably accurate to to deduce that the devil spent a good amount of time observing Adam and Eve before he took the form of a serpent to question Eve. And the fact that he doesn't go to Adam tells you something, doesn't it? He knows he has less chance of upending the work of God, of introducing rebellion and pride into the world, if he goes directly to Adam. He knows if he goes to Eve, he will have a better chance. He does it intentionally. Now, this probably speaks to the fact, to some degree, that Eve is the helper. But that works both ways. Because on the one hand, you might say, well, like the Bible says, she's the weaker vessel. Meaning physically, she's weaker. But it also speaks to the power of her ability to influence him. She could do what the devil could not. And he sought to tap into that, that God-given voice to get him to rebel. And he did. Now, to be clear, her influence doesn't negate or diminish Adam's rebellion. Adam, as a representative head of the human race, were all plunged into the state of sin because Adam failed here. It wasn't Eve's sin that plunged the human race into sin. It was Adam's. And God had given everything to Adam. And he gave Adam the creation mandate. But Adam rebelled. And it might bring up that question, you know, would he have done it anyway at some future point? Well, we don't know for sure, right? Right? But what we do know is that he wouldn't have done it right then. Her voice moved him to act, to act in this case in rebellion against God. Well, we might want to ask here, what should she have said? What could she have said? How could her voice have been used to magnify God rather than to cultivate rebellion? Remember, she was created as a helper fit for Adam. 
And her words to Adam should have glorified the Lord who had made them, made them gloriously, made them for his glory. That would have been an amazingly true help. She could have said something to Adam like, hey, the serpent is telling me something different from what the Lord God has told us. Uh, Should I listen to him? Or maybe she should have been more forceful and said, the serpent is trying to deceive us, Adam, and seeking to cause us to doubt the Lord God. And you know, those of you that are married, you know your husbands, they probably said, well, what do you want me to do about it? (laughs) And she should have said, I want you to stomp all over his head and kill him. That would have been super helpful. So here's another example. This one is is mixed in the positive and negative. It's it's Abraham's wife. And we talked about this not long ago in our series on understanding the patriarchs. We're still in and we're still working through Genesis. And in in this example, uh, Abraham and Sarah have been promised a son. And they've grown very old. And God has made great promises to them. But now they're at the point where they, they can... They can't sort of rationally believe God anymore because she's losing the ability to bear a child in her old age. And and, and now it's really going to, it's basically going to take a miracle for her to have a child. And, uh, And so they were getting desperate and lacking in faith. And so that brings us to the text in Genesis 16, verses 1 to 2. Now Sarai, Abraham, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Notice the words there. And Abram, Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. She's the only one that probably could have said this to him in a way that he would say, okay, I'll do it. And she had that power, that influence, a powerful voice. Again, a husband listens to rebellious words here. And notice that power of her words to move her husband to action. And let me be clear, this is not simply a pleasure trip for Abram. It's probably more of a power trip for Abram, but the story isn't over either. And we might ask again here, what what should she have said to Abram? She should have said to Abram, I don't know how this is going to work, Abram. I think my body's as good as dead. But if God said it, we can believe it. That's what she could have said. That's what she should have said. And the story's not over. So Sarah's going to have a problem here. Uh, Hagar is going to get pregnant. Uh, Abram and Hagar will have a child. The idea is that this child will be born in surrogacy to Sarai. But of course, it doesn't really work out that way. Then when God delivers on his promise and Sarai has a son, it's a miracle in her old age. She has Isaac. Now... Uh, the, there's going to be trouble because Ishmael is tormenting Isaac. And so the, the, the scripture says to us, and the child grew and was weaned, that's Isaac. And Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out the slave woman with her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And look in this case how what she says is once again powerful and influential and discerning. Yeah, you might might look at this and you might say, well, wait a minute now. So Ishmael's tormenting Isaac. 
But this was Sarah. Sarah, this was your idea. This was your idea to do surrogacy. You've got you to live with it. You've got you to lay in the bed that you made. You made the bed, you've got to lay in it. But God says, actually, she's right. The son of promise cannot be displaced by the, the, the son who is not the son of promise. The, the son who is not the son of promise will not inherit what the son of promise will inherit. And so God says, Sarah's right. Ishmael's got to go. I have to separate them out. And Sarah's maybe mixed up here, right? She doesn't appear to say it nicely. She's speaking out of her anger. She's speaking out of her fear. Maybe there's envy involved. But nevertheless, she sees rightly what Abraham does not see. She sees it and she knows it cannot go on like this. And so she goes and she speaks to her husband. She may not speak to him in a very good way, but nevertheless, she speaks to him. And God is going to listen. God's going to respond. God's going to, he's going to protect Hagar. He's going to bless Ishmael too. But but Ishmael is not the son of promise. And God's people must come through the promised one. This is where husbands and men in general should pay close attention even when something doesn't make sense to us in that immediate way, we need to manage our first response to what we're hearing from our wives and and from the ladies. And Abraham does that here. The, The matter, it says, displeases him, but he doesn't act first. First he listens and considers. And that's much better than being dismissive. Well, saying something like she's just emotional, She's just afraid, it's not making any sense, or she's being irrational. Now, of course, some words should be dismissed. Some words that women say should be dismissed. Some words that men say should be dismissed, right? Like when Eve spoke to Adam, if she missed her her moment there to be a helper and she says to him, look, this is good fruit, just like the serpent says, Adam should have said, no, Eve, this wrong, and he should have dismissed it, he should have instructed her, he should have killed the serpent. But that problem wasn't as much with Sarah or or with uh, Eve as it was with Adam, right? The same thing is is true with Job's wife. Job's wife's words should be dismissed, and, and he did dismiss them. You remember when Job was suffering and they didn't know why? She said to him, why are you holding on to your integrity? In other words, why do you still worship God and give God glory? Why do you still acknowledge God? Look what God has done to you. Can you imagine? She must have been so bitter and angry. She must have felt betrayed. But she was still wrong. She was wrong. And she tried to use her words to influence Job. Do you remember what she said to Job? She said, why don't you just curse God and die? Why do you hang on to faith in God? There's no no sense in it. I want you out of your misery. Just get rid of this notion of God and just be done with it, die. Remember what Job says to her? He doesn't call her a foolish woman, but he says, you're speaking like one of the foolish women. So he rebukes her, he corrects her, he dismisses those words, but he instructs her and equips her too, builds her up. And he was, he was vindicated, his faith in God was vindicated, and I'm sure that helped his wife too. Now, in this case, the problem wasn't as much with Sarah as it was with Abraham. He should have never engaged Hagar that way. But, but now she sees something before he sees it. And it was wisdom for him to consider well before he reacted to her fear and anger. Notice how God stands behind Sarah's words here. And I think that's key for our ladies to think of, for our wives and all of the women to think of and to recognize when you speak the will of God, when you speak the wisdom of God, when you help others, when you help men and other women, 
When you help your children, when you help those younger than you, when you help those older than you, with words that come from the, the word of God, with words that are wise, with words of wisdom, with words of grace, when you help others with it, know with those words, and you use your powerful voice in that way, guess what's going to happen? God will stand behind you. He will affirm you. This is important. Because some might note from time to time that men and husbands can be known to be stubborn. You might have noticed that from time to time. Steve sent around a meme the other day. It was a government-sponsored sign encouraging men to be responsive to health care. And the sign said, this year, thousands of men will die from stubbornness pretty good, right? But then someone had vandalized the sign and they painted underneath. No, we won't. (laughs) I'm sure it can feel like that sometimes, ladies. And so when you're dealing with a stubborn man, who, by the way, to lead and to lead well and to persevere in Christ, sometimes men are right to be stubborn. So that requires wisdom, patience as well. Sometimes what's called stubbornness is godliness. Not always, but sometimes. So when you're dealing with a stubborn man, ladies, it's time to speak. Use the power of your words. And then trust God who will stand behind your words if they're his will and if they're wise. And to pray. Speak. Trust. Pray. Use your voice. Trust the Lord to work his will. And demonstrate your trust in the Lord by praying. Once you've said what you have to say, trust and pray. Trust and pray. I know these examples here were on the negative side. We're going to turn to a couple of positive examples here. But don't miss the point. There is power in your voice, ladies. And maybe it's good to focus on the negative a little bit for that sake of reality. But if your words have been rebellious, if they haven't been according to the will of God, if they're not wise according to the scriptures, according to Christ Jesus, please know this, ladies. They're not going into a vacuum. Your words have power. Your words have power. More than you know. And they are influencing the men in your life and the world around you more than you know, which is why it's so important, so important to recognize the power of a woman's voice and to use it to magnify Jesus. So let's take a look at the second part here. Let's start up some faith to use that voice, gaining a vision for her voice, gaining a vision. Now that we're aware of the power of a woman's voice, let's gain that vision with us. So Here's a hard story that we're going to look at in Scripture. It's a wife who clearly suffered in a broken marriage. And by the way, that's been the reality since the fall. There was enmity between Adam and Eve that came after the fall, after they sinned in the garden. They were, there was opposition. They had conflict. Um, one of their sons killed another one of their sons. Can you imagine? And ever since then, There's been conflict in marriage. The conflict in our marriages to this very day are not new. But by the grace of God, they can be overcome. And we can walk as new creatures in the grace of God. And we can see every conflict as an opportunity to see Jesus glorified and exalted in our marriages and in our relationships. And so, yes... There are wives to this very day that suffer in broken marriages. And one thing I've noticed is, is that oftentimes a woman who's quick to divorce, she almost always has some reasonable problem with her husband. There's always something to, to point out and say, this makes my marriage really hard. But oftentimes they may not have grounds for biblical grounds for divorce to say, to say okay, what well, God has joined together should be put asunder because we actually have biblical grounds. But what I have seen as well 
and what often is unsung in those cases are all the women who persevere in painful marriages because they want to glorify Christ and they either don't have biblical grounds or they had biblical grounds but they said, you know what, I want to remain married anyway. Now, if someone has biblical grounds, that's something to really look at. Maybe there should be a divorce. But be careful, brothers and sisters. When someone is uh, uh, rankling for divorce, be careful that you do not quickly affirm it, but that it is properly adjudicated through the church to establish biblical grounds. Because if those grounds are not there, you do not want to be the one trying to, encouraging, putting asunder what God has joined together. This is a sacred thing. We want to be careful. Now, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, we're going to see a story. It's a story of a woman in a very difficult marriage, probably quite more difficult than almost every other marriage although I'm sure some surpass it, but it was very difficult. And at the time, David, who was not yet king, his life was being sought by King Saul. And this was made even worse because the prophet who had anointed both Samuel and then later David had just died. Samuel dies. And, and so David has to feel abandoned. He's out in the wilderness with, with a, a, a few hundred guys around him who are ready to be his warriors. And you can imagine there's, there's wives there, there's children, there's this kind of this camp out. And so they have a bit of a, a village. They're out in the wilderness, but they're kind of their own thing. He can't reenter Israelite life because the king is trying to kill him. So he's out there doing the best he can, living on the run. And he's out in the wilderness, and, um, and, and a feast day was coming up, a feast that was sacred to the Israelites. And, and so he says, okay, you know what, we got a lot of people here, and we want to we wanna honor the Lord, we want to worship him. We certainly don't have enough flocks and herds to, to do this justice. Uh, well, we've been protecting the, the local people, and there's this particularly wealthy man, and he's benefited. We've protected him all this time. Maybe he'd be willing to give us something. And, and, and in this story, keep in mind, you know, David, they're in the wilderness, but they're doing this good work for the people around them, and in particular, this wealthy man. And so when David goes to him, it's not a shakedown. David's not saying to him, listen, you better give me what I want or I'm going to come after you. David's saying to him, would you please give us something? You know, especially in light of all that we've done, maybe, maybe you'll, you'll be favorable to us and you'll spare something. And, and this is a, a, a religious feast day. The Israelites were supposed to be merciful to one another. And so, and, and David's not saying, listen, I, I expect you to, feed my entire entourage to the full, but, but he's just saying, would you please spare what you can? And so it brings us to the question, how will this wealthy man, his name is Nabal, how will he respond to David's request? Well, I'll read it to you, First Samuel chapter 25, it's verses 9 to 13, I can read it to you. When David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited, and Nabal answered David's servants, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread, my water, and my meat that I have killed from my shears and give it to men who come from I do not know where? So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword, and about 400 men went up with David, while 200 remained with the baggage. David is swearing to kill all the men of Nabal's household, all of his family, all of his servants. He's so angry because not only did Nabal turn him down, 
The ball didn't say to him, oh, I wish I could, but I, I, I just barely have enough to, to feed my own servants. He doesn't say that. He mocks David. He repudiates David. He says, who's David? In other words, he, he doesn't recognize any of David's suffering. He doesn't recognize that David is from God. And he doesn't recognize the good works that David has already done to him. And his response reveals how foolish this man is. Because he considers David illegitimate. So please recognize right away, God has already anointed David to be the next king of Israel. It's just a matter of time. And so when Nabal rejects David, do you know what Nabal's doing? He's rejecting God. It'd be like rejecting Jesus now. When someone rejects Jesus, the son of God, they reject God. They don't know God. And that's what Nabal's doing. He doesn't know the Lord. He doesn't know how to walk righteously. And he doesn't see the deadly danger right in front of him because David has the power to destroy him and take what he wants and no one is going to stop him. And he is now determined to destroy this obnoxious, foolish man. But Nabal had a better half and her name was Abigail and she truly was better. And when, and when she hears about it, she hears about it from some of the servants. And the servants say, it's true. David's men have been a wall for us against the, the raiders and the bandits. They protected us day and night. They've given us real protection. Our, our, our master is wealthier because of David, they're saying. And Abigail discerns with true righteousness that David belongs to God, that David is from God. And so she acts with true righteousness. She prepares food for David and his men. Rushes out to greet him. And her actions are glorious enough. But I want to read this longer portion of the text. It's about 11 verses from 1 Samuel 25, verse 23 and following. Listen to her words closely. Listen to the beauty of these words. Listen to the insight of these words. Listen to the godliness of these words. Listen to the power of this woman's voice. Are you ready? When Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your servant, did not see the young men of my Lord, whom you sent. Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And evil shall not be found in you so long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel. My Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. And David said to Abigail, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. She speaks so beautifully and powerfully. We don't have the time to exposit everything in there, but I'll just point out two quick things. First of all, she's, she's essentially saying to him, please, please don't be like, my foolish husband, Nabal. She's saying, if you go up there and kill everybody, you're going to be just like him. You'll be no better. 
And she's saying, spare yourself from that. You're, you're better than that. Be righteous. That's what she's saying to him. You know what else she refers to? She, she says, uh, she references slinging something like a stone out of the sling. And what's that in reference to? That's a reminder of David fighting Goliath. And the faith and trust he had in the Lord, how, how he didn't save himself by his own hand, but trusted the Lord, and the Lord saved him. And so she's saying, don't, don't, don't trust your own hand to save you. Don't go up and murder everybody. Trust the Lord to save you. He'll do it again, just like he did it before. You remember. What glorious wisdom and powerful words. She saves, through these words, she saves many and keeps David from sin. We can't miss it. It's too important because right here in this broken marriage, in the, how, how, who knows how many years she suffered in this marriage with a foolish husband. But even here, she stands for righteousness and speaks for righteousness and God stands behind her. And her words have incredible effect, literally saving lives, keeping David from wicked bloodshed that he would regret later. Kept David, think about this, kept David from might makes right thinking. This had to be a huge lesson for him. Abigail did this by employing the gift of her voice and using the power of her voice. She used her voice to magnify God and the Lord blessed her. Maybe today you know a woman who's in a difficult marriage with a, a foolish husband, a, a man who, who will not listen to reason or righteousness, who goes about his way and will not change. Maybe you see that woman and you notice that she feels trapped. Know this too. A day of resolution will come. We don't know when that day of resolution will come, but it will come. It will absolutely come. God may call you to patience in a difficult marriage while he works out his plans and his good ways. Trust him. The day of resolution will come. Maybe her voice seemed many times to have no impact at all. And maybe she's just practicing for this speech and doesn't even know it. But she's learning what righteousness is and learning how to speak it and learning how to use her voice so that when the day comes and she speaks to David, she knows just what to say and how to say it. So speak, ladies, and trust women and pray, and God will stand behind you. Mothers and all of our ladies, your words can reveal Jesus to the world. I don't want to take much longer, but I do want to remind you of the, of, of the wedding at Cana. Look at, look at this moment in, from John chapter 2. When the wine ran out at the wedding, the mother of Jesus, Mary, said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And, you know, you just think about this for a moment. It's like, you just get the idea. He's like, Mom, come on, Mom. You know, but she knows him. And then look up at the screen and look what he says next. His mother, or rather what, what she says next. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Because she knew her son. And she used her voice. You know what's amazing about this? Or, I mean, there's a lot that's amazing, right? Jesus turns water into wine. But one of the things that's amazing about this is, is, is the book of John, the gospel of John is written so that everyone who reads it will come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing they would have life in his name. And the whole structure of the gospel of John that is written so that people would believe and have life in Jesus are these seven signs. And which is the first of the seven signs? It's when Jesus turns the water into wine. And what prompts 
the turning of water into wine. It's the powerful voice of a mother persuading her Savior son to turn water into wine. And finally, remember that the women who testified to Jesus' resurrection, that they were women. You may, you may know this already, but at the time, society at that time considered women to be unreliable witnesses. And so there were certain aspects of, of formal court proceedings that they were uh, excluded from. Because society at large has said, well, they won't be reliable. But who, who are the first ones that the Lord reveals his resurrection to? It's the women. The women that faithfully went to, to, to take care of his body. To mourn him and to grieve and to dignify his body. They go to the tomb. And when they get there, it's, the stone is rolled back. And they end up running and, and telling the disciples, he, his body's not there. And Peter and John knew them well enough to know. Maybe they didn't believe them right away, but they knew them well enough. Something's up. And it was their testimony, their powerful words, that sent Peter and John to the tomb, who verified, and these apostles the gospel itself built on these apostles who saw Jesus the Christ resurrected. Women were involved in that too and their powerful voice. Can you see, ladies, why God has given you a voice? Not for rebellion. Oh, there are many voices in the world and they're, they're, they go on and on forever. But that's not why the Lord gave you a voice. He gave you a voice to proclaim Jesus to magnify him, to point many to him, to point, if you're married, your husbands to him. And if you're not married, to point other men to him, to point God's people to him. Recognize the power of a woman's voice and use it to magnify Jesus. I'd like to